So our subject tonight then is Rome in Bible prophecy. And we'd like just to consider for a moment the idea of Bible prophecy. We've been, we've been looking at this series over the last several months. We considered, first of all, Babylon, and then the Medes and the Persians, and our last class was on Greek, or the Greeks, and this night we hope to look at Rome. And so we'd like to just consider a couple of passages before we look at Rome, just on the general subject. And the first is Amos chapter 3, and verses 6 to 7. Remembering that the prophetic word is given to us to help us to understand the future. The prophet says, Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he have taken nothing? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? And he goes on to say, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And so what we have in the word of God is the secrets that God reveals to his servants, the prophets, about things that are shortly to come to pass. And so when we look at the prophets like Isaiah, for instance, Isaiah chapter 46, we have here a statement made by God. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all of my pleasure. And so what God's word is, is an indication to us from the beginning of what's going to happen in the end. And it gives us confidence because when we see prophecies laid out that are then fulfilled, we have a confidence that the rest of the word of God is in fact true and can be countenance. We can look at these things and trust them and hopefully follow them. And so when we come to the book of Revelation, if you just turn to Revelation chapter 1, we have a, a few statements that are made in Revelation chapter 1, which is a prophetic book looking forward to the future that gives us sort of the idea of what both Isaiah and what Amos have had to say. In Revelation chapter 1, it tells us it's the revelation or the apocalypse or the revealing of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent it and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So the idea here is that it is showing the servants things which are going to come to pass. And the word signified there means to express by sign or by symbol. So there are signs and symbols that are given telling us about the future. And when we look at what has happened in the past, we have a perspective of this is what God had laid out from the very beginning. And when we sort of see where we are today, we realize that his plan and purpose is still being worked out. So when we think about the future, we know what is going to be coming upon us. So we read in Revelation chapter three or chapter one, verse three, though, it's not just an academic exercise, but it requires a response from us. We read, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So it's about reading and hearing and and listening and obeying those things, but keeping them because they are the, the time is at hand and it requires from us a response. So when we come to prophecy, then when we come to looking at what God has to say, we are clear that, in fact, it does require an effort on our behalf. It's not just something that we look at and we can be sort of interested in, but rather it invokes from us some kind of a reference, some kind of something that we have to do. It's not just giving us the, the, the map of, you know, April the 9th, 2014, this or that is going to happen, but we have to search these things out. Proverbs 25 verse 2 tells us it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So when we come to the book of prophecy, whether it's in Amos or Daniel or when we're in the book of Revelation, it requires a little bit of searching out to find out what are the symbols or the signs that are expressed that declare the end from the beginning. The things that God has laid out from former times when he has made known to his servants, the prophets, what shall be in the latter days. 
So we'd like to come then to the book of Daniel, and to begin with, we want to look at Daniel chapter 2. We read a little section from Daniel chapter 7, which is a parallel to Daniel chapter 2. It's talking about the same time periods, just depicting them a little differently. And in Daniel chapter 2, and in verse 28, we read there that there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So what Daniel is revealing to King Nebuchadnezzar back around the year 606 uh, BC, so 600 600 years before Christ, 2,600 some years ago, is a picture of what's actually going to exist in the latter days. And he tells us in verse 29, he reveals his secrets and makes known what shall come to pass. And so when we look at the book of Daniel, that's exactly what we have. We have the picture of what is going to come to pass. And it's God that makes these things known. There's no greatness in any person. And Daniel points that out to the king. There was no greatness in him. But it was God that has laid these things out. And it wasn't to the soothsayers and astrologers, the scientists of his day, or the magicians, or whatever they might be. They had no idea about the things of the future. It was given to those servants of God to show the things that would shortly come to pass. So we're, we're jumping into the story tonight at a bit of an advanced stage because we've already looked at much of Nebuchadnezzar's image as it's laid out for us in Daniel chapter 2. There was this head of gold, a chest and arms of silver, a belly of thighs of brass, and these legs of iron. And we've looked and seen how that Babylon was that head of gold. The Medes and the Persians were the chest and arms of silver. And the Greeks were the belly and thighs of brass. So we're given the starting point. We're told in in Daniel chapter 2, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. And Daniel tells him, You are the head of gold. And after you, there's going to come another kingdom. And then following that, there's going to be another one. And then eventually a fourth kingdom. And so when we look at history, it's not very difficult to do. you just got to take a, a book, you know, even a child's textbook, grade 8 or 9, usually goes through world history at that point in time. And it'll tell you that in 606 was the kingdom of Babylon. And it ruled over the Middle East at that point in time. Along came Cyrus and the Medes and the Persians, and they took over from him, and they conquered that empire. Then there was the Greeks, led by Alexander the Great, who we looked at in our last session. And then following them comes the Romans. They are the fourth kingdom, which makes up the legs of the iron of this image. And it's Rome, then, that we really want to spend our time considering uh, tonight. So in Daniel chapter 11, or chapter 7, sorry, 7, chapter 2, and verse 40, we read here about this described fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron... For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh in all in, uh, breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. So that's a description of the character of this kingdom. It would be a brutal empire, one that would break in pieces and bruise. It's going to crush. And so that's what that kingdom does, as we'll look at from history in just a moment. But now come over, if you would, if you've got your Bible open. Just flip over a couple of pages to chapter 7, because this is where we have a parallel to Daniel chapter 2. So as there are stages of metals, the Babylonian gold, the Medo-Persian silver, the Greek brass, and the Roman iron, and so on, in Daniel chapter 7, we have four great beasts that are described. And we looked at them um, as we read through Daniel chapter 7, the first little part, and we find that there is four beasts... There is a a lion with wings that eventually has the wings plucked up and it stands up. That is the Babylonians. There is a bear, which is the Medo-Persians, which is lifted up on one side. There is the Greeks, which are depicted as a leopard with four heads and four wings. And finally, there's this fourth peculiar creature described as simply a fourth beast. And that's what we want to really spend our time looking at tonight. So he tells us, he came near to one of them that stood by, which would be the angels that were showing him this vision, and he asked him, well, what does all this mean? What is the truth of all this? And the angel told him and said, and made known to him the interpretation of the things. He says, these great beasts, which are four, 
are for kings or kingdoms which will arise out of the earth. So when we're looking at the beast, it's no different than Daniel chapter 2. We're looking at the four kingdoms that would arise up out of the earth. And this fourth one that we're dealing with is described in detail in verse 7 as we read. Not a pretty picture. He says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. And it devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, but it was different from the beasts that were before it, because this one, strangely enough, has ten horns. So this is the description that's given, and we we can see some parallels. It has iron teeth, because it sits as the fourth empire. And of course, when you look at the image, there was the head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, but the fourth metal was iron, the iron legs. Well, this creature has iron teeth. Remember, the the image was going to break in pieces and bruise. Well, this creature here is described as stamping the residue and breaking in pieces as well. The image has its ten toes. Well, this one has ten horns. And so this fourth beast, we're told in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23, is the fourth kingdom or empire that's going to be upon the earth. And it's different from all the kingdoms, and it's going to devour the whole earth, and will tread it down, and will break in pieces. So that's the picture that's given us in Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, of an empire that would come along, that would break in pieces, and devour the whole earth. It would take over everything. Now that's Daniel chapter 2, and then we have Daniel chapter 7. Now, after the class is done, there's a chart hanging on the wall downstairs that kind of lays all these things out sequentially so you can look at them uh, side by side. It's just downstairs where we have our refreshments on the wall there. But Daniel chapter 8, if you just want to turn over the page, we have another vision given to us here. We're dealing with the time period then of the Roman Empire, and Daniel chapter 8 gets into this, but he kind of gives us the how we get there situation. There is a ram and a goat in Daniel chapter 8, and we looked at this last time, how that the ram would come and it would strike, or the goat would come and it would crush the ram and smite it to pieces, break it in pieces, and then further developments would take place. So that's the picture that's given. We're dealing with the time period of Rome, but Daniel chapter 8 tells us how we get there. And if you notice here, this is the Roman Empire, and it covers all of the area of those other empires. The Greeks have been swallowed up by it. Uh, The Medo-Persian Empire was swallowed up by it, the area it conquered over, and Babylon, and so on and so forth. We want to zoom in, though, on where we left off last time in Daniel chapter 8, and consider this goat that comes along, it destroys the Medo-Persian Empire, and it has four horns that come along. Now, just to kind of give us a little bit of reference, um, if we just take a look at Daniel chapter 8, just so we know that we're dealing with the same picture, it tells you at the end of it what we are dealing with. Verse 20, the ram which you saw having two horns... That's the kings of the Medes and the Persians. So that's dealing with the same period as the chest and arms of silver. It's the Medo-Persians. The Greeks, in verse 21, is the rough goat. The rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And that great horn gets broken off and in, in its place come up four other horns. And we looked at this last time. And we saw how that the, the empire of Alexander the Great, who was the emperor who took over the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greeks, as they, they came from the west and they moved very quickly through that empire, they took it over and um, they destroyed that empire, consumed it, and broke it to pieces. And then when Alexander it was the height of his power, he died, of course, in Babylon, and in his place, over about a 50-year period, four generals kind of came to the top and divided up his empire. And that's what's given to us in verse 8. The goat waxed very great. When he was strong, the great horn was broken, and in its place came up four notable horns. Right? Or four... Uh, sorry, um... Yes, four notable horns, and then out of one of them came this little horn, which waxed exceeding great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the west. Now, you just have to stop and think for a moment. Well, 
what is it talking about? The empire was divided into four, the Ptolemies, the Seleucids, uh, were the main ones that were kind of north and south. Ptolemy was in Egypt, Seleucus was in the north, and there was two other emper- emperors, Cassandra and Lysimachus. And out of one of these would come this little horn, and if you notice where it comes from, it comes, or comes to, it comes toward the south, so that means it's got to be north. It comes towards the east, which means it's got to be coming from the west, and also towards the pleasant land, which is a description of the, uh, the land of Israel. So in history, as we read the story of what took place, we find out that when the empire was divided amongst the four emperors, the, um, one of them, as time went by, the Macedonian empire that is, he uh, was defeated by the Romans in about 168 BC. So the Romans took over the Macedonian Empire around 168 BC. And further to that, in about 133 BC, the next area over, which was the Thessalian Kingdom, um, which was run by a a guy named Attalus, uh, or Attalus, uh, he willed his kingdom, formerly the Thracian Kingdom, to the Roman Empire. So he gave it over. He didn't have an heir. Um, So what he said was, well, there's nobody else that I really want to rule. So in his will, he said, the Romans can have it. So the Romans came out of this area, and they basically had colonized from Italy into Greece and into Macedonia, and eventually they simply took it over. So out of the north and out of the west came this Roman Empire. And so we have then a period of Roman wars that take place um, back in the history of the world. And this is seeing what was written 600 BC. We're now running around the period of, of 54 BC. So this is a short period before the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of these people we're familiar with. Um, we know, of course, the man Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar... Um, is very famous, very, of course, Shakespeare wrote a play on him, so we all know about Julius Caesar and Brutus. And um, he was one of the first of the, uh, what's called the triumvirate rulers. And before he was, he was uh, supreme, he was with a guy named Gaius Pompeius Magnus, who we know as Pompey. And um, one we don't know as well, perhaps, is Marcus Licinius Crassus. And the three of them basically ruled the empire together. And of course, as the scriptures tell us, no man can serve two masters, because he'll hate the one and love the other. Well, if you can't serve two, try serving three. That doesn't work well either, and they couldn't work together very well either. So uh, what happened was, is that there was, there was a civil war between these three, eventually. And uh, Marcus Crassus um, would try and mediate between Julius Caesar and uh, um, Pompus or Pompey. And um, it's interesting that Pompey was actually Julius Caesar's son-in-law. He'd married Caesar's daughter as a way to kind of cozy up with the ruler or the main sort of dog of the time, I guess you could say. And, um, but the problem was is there was, there was trouble between them. The scriptures tell us, though, if you just have your Bible still open at Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9, that there would be this little horn, as we've read, that would come out of them, or one of them, which would be the the Macedonian Thrace area, and it would wax exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, but also towards the pleasant land. And it was during the time period that Pompey was a general... Um, that he actually began a series of campaigns that brought him right into the land of Israel. If you know a little bit about the history of Israel, you've probably heard about the Maccabees, right? The Maccabees were ones that were famous for throwing off the Greek rule. Um, They rebelled against the Greek rulers, the Greek um, or Seleucid rulers, and um, they established their own independent state for a short period of time, the Maccabeans. Herod the Great is is descended from them, or by marriage anyway. And um, it was under them that the temple was, was rebuilt. Well, it was Nehemiah and Ezra that rebuilt it. They rebuilt it again, a little bigger model. And they established an independent state for a period of time. 
didn't last very long because it was Pompey that would come along and he would destroy um, the state that they had established and establish Roman rule over the area of Judea around 63 BC, fulfilling the words of Daniel 8 that this little horn would wax exceeding great towards the pleasant land. Well, it was shortly after this um, that things didn't go very well. In fact, Pompey and his father-in-law, Julius Caesar, fell out because Caesar's daughter died after childbirth. And so there was a bit of bad blood between the two of them, and a civil war erupted. And so Crassus died after about a year in office. So he was off the scene, the mediator, and it was just the two of them left to duke duke it out. And so there was civil war between Caesar and Pompey. And um, two major battles were fought. The first was at a place called Pharsalus in 48 BC, and the same year in Alexandria in Egypt. And Pompey um, escaped to Alexandria, hoping there to kind of take the the Roman forces that were there and some of the Greeks and kind of reestablish himself. But they decided better, and they, uh, they killed him. So that was the end of Pompey. Um, Julius Caesar didn't do a whole lot better. He lasted about four more years. And then, of course, we know the story how that Julius Caesar um, was assassinated by Brutus, Marcus Junius Brutus. And so, um, you know, A2 Brutus and all that, he was stabbed in the back, and that was the end of Julius Caesar, which left a bit of a, a void in the Roman Empire. And so, in its place, a second triumvirate was established in 43 BC. There were three dictators at this point in time, and uh, we know some of them. They're familiar to us. One of them is Gaius Octavius Thrinius. Um, He was a general uh, when he was Octavian, as we know him as. Um, He would later become Caesar Augustus. Um, The one we're not so familiar with, perhaps Marcus... Aemilius Lepidus, and the one we know as well, quite well, is Marcus Antonius, who was a good friend and uh, cohort of Caesar, or Julius Caesar, one of his generals who worked with him. Well, Octavian was the adopted son of Caesar. When Caesar died in his will, he didn't have a, an heir himself. Um, so what he did was he basically, um, well, not a legitimate heir anyway, he had lots of mistresses and who knows how many children, but he um, didn't have a legitimate heir, so he willed his portion to um, Octavian. And uh, he ruled over the western area of the empire, and uh, so Italy in that area. Marcus Lepidus ruled over Africa, and uh, Marcus Antonius ruled over the east And he figured he would sort of do the same thing that Pompey did, and he would cozy up to Octavian, so he married Octavian's sister. And um, they were all united in war against Brutus, who had attacked Caesar. And, of course, um, when you have a common enemy, um, people tend to work together. However, once that enemy's gone, things don't necessarily last that long. And it's at this point in time that Herod the Great comes onto the scene. It was Herod who came to Rome to argue for his rulership over the area of Galilee. Mark Antony rose up in the Senate to explain his next mission to Palestine to restore Roman rule and asked the Senate to confirm Herod as the king of all Judea, which they did, voting unanimously, and gave him sort of the right to go in there and... uh, kick out the usurpers. So Herod was very thankful to Mark Antony, and he was established as king at this point in time. He was an Idumean, which is an Edomite, um, descendant of Esau, and comes from the south of the land of Israel, and the area of Petra and so on. But he was very thankful for what Caesar had done, or what um, Uh, Antony had done. So um, he began his illustrious career. He is the one, of course, that built much of what is left in the land today, much of the archaeological remains. He built um, this place here, the fortress that sits on the side of the Temple Mount, and um, he called it the Antonian Fortress, after Mark Antony who was his patron, the one who had basically given him the job. So nothing like sucking up to the boss. Um, He named this building after him. 
But of course, he also built the temple, which was begun in around 20 BC, and um, remains of it are there today, at least the platform is. He greatly expanded what the Hasmoneans had built under the Maccabees. And the other thing he built was the tomb of the patriarchs, which still stands today in the land of Israel, in Hebron, and it's the oldest freestanding building that has survived uh, that amount of time in the Middle East. So that's the Herod we know, of course, who around the time of the Lord Jesus Christ was the one that had all the children put to death. Well, everything was going swimmingly in the Middle East until um, Antony fell in love with Cleopatra. She was the last Ptolemaic queen of Egypt, and the two of them had a love affair. And um, unfortunately, of course, don't forget that Antony was married to Octavian's sister. So this didn't go over very well. Um, especially when the children of Cleopatra, one was from the previous Caesar, Julius Caesar, and some of Antony's own children were put in positions of power and authority that being illegitimate children, because she was not a Roman, um, the Romans didn't like too much. And of course, Octavian capitalized on this and convinced the Roman Senate to declare war on Antony, who he believed had become too much of a Greek and was learning the Greek ways and uh, they wanted to get rid of him. Really, it was just a, a grab for power. And so, once again, three rulers doesn't work, and we end up with two um, fighting together, Mark Antony and Octavian. And it all took place in a battle of Actium, which is just off the coast of Greece, in the year 31 BC. So we're only now 20 something, 28 years before the Lord Jesus Christ, A huge uh, naval battle was fought. Uh, Cleopatra had supplied Antony with the ships, and the Romans had ships of their own. And in the Ionian Sea, near the city of Actium in Greece, the battle was fought. It was an absolute resounding disaster for Octavian. And um, he uh, lost, and he and Cleopatra, who were there in the vicinity, fled to Egypt. In fact, they both had different ships, and she, um, she fled in her ship, and he fled in his. And they ended up back in Egypt, but they lost in 31 BC. And of course, we know the story. Uh, Cleopatra committed suicide. Um, well, it was actually Antony who committed suicide first. He uh, thrust himself through with a sword. And then Cleopatra poisoned herself. And uh, the two of them um, were dead. I think she died from the bite of a serpent, it is believed. So with everybody out of the way... It left simply Gaius Octavius, who said, enough of this three ruler thing. We're going to go back to the days of one ruler and we're going to take the title Caesar after his uh, adopted father, Julius Caesar. So that was his actual name. Um, It now became a title meaning emperor and he would be the only emperor. But of course, there was a problem is that Herod had been a subordinate appointed by Mark Antony. And when this whole war went on, Herod had joined in with Mark Antony. So he decided that, you know, discretion was the greater part of valor. And following the defeat at Actium, he traveled to meet uh, Octavian in Rhodes. And he uh, arrived in the conqueror's presence. He took off his crown and didn't go in to presume his kingship but told Octavian that as he had been loyal to Antony, who was the Caesar over that area, he pledged his loyalty to Octavian, and Octavian agreed to this and uh, confirmed him as Caesar, and uh, or not Caesar, sorry, as king of the whole area of Judea. So it expanded his kingdom because Cleopatra had never liked Herod and had always sort of stolen a piece of his kingdom for herself. Now with her out the way, Herod ruled over the whole area of Judea, um, which is the only time anybody ruled over that whole area independently. After that, it was divided up. But Caesar Augustus, as he became known, is the one we read about in Luke chapter 2 and verse 1. It came to pass in those days that went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, who is Octavian, that all the world should be taxed. So what that does is it tells us that we're living in the time period now where you have a situation the Romans have magnified themselves, as Daniel 8 told us, against the pleasant land, and they've established themselves there as supreme rulers over it. 
But Daniel adds a little bit more detail as to what is going to happen. He tells us in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9 that this little horn, this Roman horn that would grow up, would wax great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the stars of the, uh, the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them, and would magnify himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary would be cast down. Well, some of this we've already seen. They magnified themselves against the stars of heaven. Well, that's political uh, heavens. That's the language of the, the prophets. And when it talks about stars and heavens, it's talking about rulers. And so some of the rulers would be thrown to the ground. Well, that was the Maccabees. They were tossed out of rulership and they were thrown to the ground. But he goes on to say that not only that... It's this little horn that would magnify himself against the prince of the host. Well, the prince of the land of Israel at this point in time, um, they didn't have a Jewish king. Herod was king, but I mean, he's an Idumean or an Edomite. Um, the prince of the host that it would magnify himself against was, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And eventually, it would take away the daily sacrifice and the place of the sanctuary. So, of course, it's under the Romans that the Lord Jesus Christ would be crucified. And the Romans and the Jews would unite together. And Pilate, of course, would order his crucifixion. And those of us who have been going through the daily reading planners, have, we've just read about this recently. Well, there is a stone taken from the area of Caesarea, um, where it was dug up in the, in the sands there, which has Pilate's name right on it. So it's not like these people are mythical characters. These are real people, and the evidence of them is left behind for us. And it's interesting because, um, you know, a lot of the, the anti-Semites today, um, well, through the ages, have accused the Jews of deicide. Right, of, of murdering God, which doesn't make any sense anyway. Um, but they forget the fact that it was actually the Romans um, who carried out the sentence. And it was Pilate who gave it. It was the Roman soldiers who crucified him, although the Jews did say that his blood be upon us, upon our children. But they were involved in this together. And so when we read those words of Daniel chapter 9, that he would magnify himself against the prince of the host, and it tells us elsewhere that he would be cut off, um, that's exactly what took place. The Romans did that. So this is their place in Bible prophecy. But they would go on, though, to take away the daily sacrifice and cast down the sanctuary. So turn, if you would, if you've got your Bibles open, let's go to Luke chapter 21. Because this is an event that the Lord Jesus Christ also comments on. And it's what is called in the New Testament, it's found in Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke, as the Olivet Prophecy. It's a prophecy given when the Lord Jesus Christ was sitting on the Mount of Olives. They had been in the temple and they'd watched the widow cast in her mites, if you remember the story. They'd exited the temple. They were sitting on the Mount of Olives, which looks over to the, the, uh, the temple. And the disciples were admiring the wonderful temple and the beautiful stones and telling the Lord Jesus Christ how incredible it looked. And so what we see there in chapter 21 of Luke um, is that they would be, in verse 5, some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gift. Jesus said, as for these things which you behold, the days will come in which there's not going to be one stone left upon another which will not be thrown down. So that's what's going to happen. And in fact, he references the prophet Daniel. It comes in Matthew chapter 24, which is the counter to Luke chapter 21. He says, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso reads, let him understand. Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. So he says, look, there's going to come a time when there's going to be an abomination uh, desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. It's going to come. It's going to stand right in the holy place of the temple. Back in Luke 21, it's put a little differently. He says, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, know the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and them which in the midst of it depart out, let them not return into the countries. And so that's the picture that's given to us, the Lord picking up on the prophecy of Daniel that armies would come along and they would destroy the temple itself and the desolation thereof would be nigh. 
And so what we find in the history of the world is that we have two men that come on the scene now. One of them is Vespasian. He is the emperor at the time and his son Titus. First of all, actually Vespasian isn't the emperor. He's simply a general. And Titus is with him, his son, and they're sent by the emperor into Jerusalem to put down the revolt of the Jews, because the Jews revolt against Roman rule. They decide they don't want to be ruled by the Romans anymore, and um, they come down into to, uh, the land of Israel, and it's the emperor Nero, of course, that burnt Rome to the ground, that is uh, on the throne at this point in time, or in the, uh, ruling over the empire. So they get to Jerusalem, and they take the whole of Israel, and they come right to Jerusalem, and they encircle the, the, the royal city, the main city, where the temple is. Most of the Jews have fled to that city, and um, they're ready to take it by siege. But Caesar, Nero that is, goes and dies on them. And they don't have their final marching orders. So they're not about to siege a city without the, the decree from the emperor. It's kind of like the gladiators. You need the thumbs up or the thumbs down. And they didn't get the thumbs down, so they, they left. And so they, they withdrew, and they went away for a period of time. And um, then somebody else was appointed as emperor. And uh, Vespasian wasn't really happy with this. He was down in Egypt at the time. And um, he didn't really like their choice. And Rome really erupted into a civil war because several people wanted to have the throne. And so Vespasian's soldiers proclaimed him to be emperor, and he set off to Rome to claim it for himself, leaving Titus in Egypt. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, know the desolation thereof is nigh. Well, it's about a four-year period that they came, they surrounded the country, and then they left. And uh, so it seemed like everything was fine. So the Lord says, look, if you see that happen, don't go into the city and take your possessions. If you're on the rooftop, don't go into the house and get your stuff. Get out. And so the faithful people who saw the Romans leave took that as their cue and they exited the city. They heard the word, as it says in Revelation, but they kept the things that were therein. So they left. Well, of course, Titus then does get the, the order from his father now, Vespasian, who was the emperor, to go back uh, to the land. And Judea, in the meantime, had fallen into complete civil war. The factions of the Herodians and, and, the, and the Pharisees and the others all fighting over the temple itself. And in fact, um, there was a war going on in the temple property between the different factions of Jews. So when Titus returns... He comes along and, and destroys the city of, of Jerusalem. And, of course, we know about the Arch of Titus, which uh, depicts them carrying the candelabra off to Rome in, uh, in Rome itself now. And it there stands as a testimony to what the Lord said would take place. Well, it was a terrible, terrible destruction. It's described in great detail by Josephus, the Jewish historian, who was originally a general, uh, but ended up being captured and wrote a history of the war. He claims that over a million one hundred thousand people were killed during the siege. There were ninety seven thousand who were captured and enslaved and uh, an absolutely terrible, terrible time. And it's interesting because when Sister Sherlyn and I happened to go to Israel, we went to a place in Israel, which was the, the sewers um, where many of the Jews escaped to um, during the siege. There were some that jumped down, jumped down into the sewers and they escaped from there. And uh, this is Lane Rittmeyer, the archaeologist, taking us through this area. And it was just newly discovered and we were actually the first tour group to go through there. And this is what it looks like. That's the, uh, the sewer itself. They had escaped out of this area. And uh, we got to walk through and see exactly um, what it was like. So there we are walking through um, that area. So it was quite fascinating. A tiny little space filled with refuse at the time. Um, not when we walked through. Uh, the Romans though found out that they were down in the sewers. And... Um, they went down there, and many were slain as they tried to escape out of that dark little space. Had they listened to the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, this would not have happened. And the same thing is true for us. If we listen to Christ, we won't get trapped in the tunnels of the world 
and perish the same way these people did. So a a very tragic time. Um, But there's the evidence left over from that period in history. But we go on to read that this would continue on. In Daniel chapter 8, in verse 13, Daniel's really concerned about this prophecy about these Romans and what they're going to do to the land. So he says, well, how long shall this vision be uh, concerning the daily sacrifice, the transgression of desolation? Well, you can take out the italics because they're not in the original. How long will the vision, uh, the daily, and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he's told by one of the angels, it's for a period of 2,300 days, and then will the sanctuary be cleansed. So he's given a prophetic time period that the Romans are going to come along. All this is going to take place Well, the Greeks and the Romans and everybody else. This is the series of events. And it's for 2,300 days. Remember what we looked at in Isaiah 46. God told us that he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Well, this riddle of how long this 2,300 years has been looked at by Bible students for many, many years. This is a man named Thomas Newton. I've got this book at home on my shelf. Love the hairdo. Um, But here's Thomas Newton. It's written in the year 1754. So this is going back a few years. And this is what he has to say in his dissertation on the prophecies. And he goes on to say that he says, I conceive this time period, is what he's talking about, is to be computed from the vision of the he-goat, or Alexander's invading Asia. Alexander invaded Asia in the year of the world 300, or 3,670, and in the year before Christ, 334. 2,300 years from that time will draw towards the conclusion of the sixth millennium of the world, And about that period, according to an old tradition, which was current before our Savior's time and was probably founded upon the prophecies, um, great changes and revolutions are expected. Rome is to be overthrown and the Jews are to be restored. Now, he's looking at Daniel 8. That's the vision of the goat that would come and it would smite the ram. The ram. And he says, like, how long is the vision? Well, we're told it's 2,300 days. Now, he takes the biblical principle of a day for a year, and he says, well, that must be 2,300 years then. And if the goat smote the ram in the year 333, we've got to compute it from there. Now, I'm a graphic designer by trade or by training, not a mathematician. So I had to take out a piece of paper, write down the period... Uh, 2,300 years. Um, The starting point, which is actually 333 BC, um, uh, Newton was off a year, and say, well, what does that come out to? And it happens to come out, just by doing the math, to 1967. And what happened in 1967? Well, that was the year that the Jews, the Israelis at this point in time, having the state founded in 1948, took over the West Bank and the city of Jerusalem. And so he says, the transgression of desolation hath now continued 1,700 years when he was writing. They expect, and we expect at length, the sanctuary to be cleansed, and that is God's determined time. His promise will be fulfilled or will be fully accomplished when he says, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David that has fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seat after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. And so, he says, our Savior's words are very memorable. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. It is still trodden down by the Gentiles when he's writing in 1754. And consequently, the times of the Gentiles are not fulfilled. When the time of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled, then the expression implies um, that the Jews will be restored. So you've got to remember, he's writing in 1754. That's 40-something years before the French Revolution uh, and the events that would take place. 30 to 40 years before all that tumultuous time, the Jews are completely suppressed throughout Europe. The Inquisition is still officially going on at this point in time. They're a nobody. 
But he looked at that and he said, well, this all has to change because the Bible says it's got to change. And a writer writing after these events, um, or after Newton, I should say, a little bit earlier uh, to our time or closer to our time, 1955. So this is a few years before this would take place, but 13 years. But still, even though there was a state of Israel, Jerusalem was in the hand of the Jordanians. And he says, because Jerusalem, in other words, old Jerusalem, must be possessed by the Jews prior to Christ's return, so that he might manifest himself to them as their deliverer and savior, the ejection or the throwing out of the Hashemite Jordanians from there is a foregone conclusion. We can look then for developments which will result in Israel getting possession of the whole city and for a dreadful conflagration kindled by that spark throughout the Middle East. So he says, like, once they get possession of the whole city, it's going to be a spark that's going to set off a war like you've never seen before. And, of course, if we just look at our history, we look at this time period, let's draw this out, how long will it be that the sanctuary is going to be trodden underfoot and this vision is going to take place? Well, the Battle of Issus began in the year 333 B.C., The sanctuary was destroyed in 70 BC by the little horn that came out of one of those four horns. A 2300-year period brings you to 1967. And at that point in time, there would be the restoration of Jerusalem that was taken by the Romans back to Jewish control. And a writer, a man named John Thomas, writing in 1848... Uh, a little bit before these events, reading all this information from Newton and from the Bible, said there has to be then a partial and primary restoration of the Jews before the manifestation, meaning the return of Christ, which is to serve as the nucleus or basis of future operations in the restoration of the rest of the tribes after he has appeared in his kingdom. The pre-adventural colonization of the Palestine will be on purely political principles, and the Jewish colonists will return in unbelief of the Messiahship of Jesus and of the truth as it is in him. Now, friends, just stop and think about that. He's saying, look, we all pray, Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's been the Christian prayer for years and years and years. And some people don't believe that the kingdom is going to be on earth, but that's what they pray nonetheless. The kingdom would be on earth. Well, Thomas is basically relating this fact, and he says, look, if the kingdom's going to be on earth, and the Lord Jesus Christ is going to rule there, because that's what Gabriel told Mary, that she would have a son who would sit on the throne of David, which happens to be in Jerusalem, and that he would reign over the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what Christ told the disciples. When Peter says, look, we've forsaken all and followed you, in Matthew 19, verse 43, he says, what's in it for us? And Christ says, well, unto you which have followed me in the regeneration or the restoration, when the Son of Man sits upon the throne of his glory, you are also going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So he looked for Israel's kingdom to be reestablished in the earth. The angel Gabriel told Mary that was what was going to happen. And in Acts 1, verse 6, the disciples asked Christ, well, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And later on in Acts chapter 3, I think it's around verse 19, that they, they, they basically go out and they preach and they say, look, the Lord has gone to heaven until the restitution of all things. And that's when he's going to come back. And that's what the angels told the men on Mount Olives. They said, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which has gone from you up into heaven is going to return in like manner as you see him go. That's the promise that's been made. That's why the meek are told they're going to inherit the earth. And that's what we look forward to. Thomas, reading all that, said, well then, if that's going to happen, before Jesus comes back, if he's going to be king over this people, then they've got to go back to the land. And that, of course, was written in 1848. 1948, a hundred years later, is when they did go back to the land. 1967 was when Jerusalem, that had been trodden down of the Gentiles, became once again part of the state of Israel. 
So in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 11, another uh, prophecy, God tells the people, tells Jeremiah, um, I am with thee, saith Yahweh, uh, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, I will not make a full end of you. But I will correct thee in measure and not leave thee altogether unpunished. So even though Hitler tried to make a full end of this nation with the Holocaust and tried to exterminate the Jew, Jude, meaning, of course, Judah, that's where it comes from, he wasn't able to do it. And so towards the end of that 2300-year period, the Jewish state was proclaimed in 1948. And then, in 1967, the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. And here you see Israeli paratroopers, the first ones into the area of the the, uh, what we call today the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall, which is the platform area of the the sanctuary um, or of the of the temple. 1967, they came back to this area and took it once again. The times of the Gentiles, then, friends, are finished. They have drawn to a close. And all we're waiting for is the Lord Jesus Christ, who we read about in Acts chapter 3, that he would be received into heaven. In fact, let's just look that one up. Acts chapter 3, because it's an important one to just consider. And I, I probably quote it wrong, so we'll just look it up and get it right. This is what they went out to teach. But we're living in the time when it's actually happened. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing or restoration is going to come from the presence of the Lord. And what's he going to do at the time of restoration? Well, he's going to send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive... Until the times of the restitution of all things, which God has spoken uh, by the mouth of the holy prophets since the world began. So he's in heaven only for a period of time. He's not staying there. He's coming back. And it's the end of these times of the Gentiles. In fact, if you come over to Revelation chapter 3, you'll notice there's a subtle statement that he makes in chapter 3 verse 21. When he promises to reign with him. Remember he promised in Acts chapter 19 that the disciples would rule with him and sit on 12 thrones? Well, in Revelation 3, he says, in verse 21, To him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcome and am sat down with my Father in his throne. So Jesus doesn't promise us to sit with the Father in his throne. He says, that's where I am. He says, you're going to sit with me in my throne. Well, what's his throne? Well, that was the throne that was promised in uh, Luke chapter 1 and 2. The the angel Gabriel that came to Mary, he would sit upon the throne of his father, David, ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. And so it is, friends, that we have then that period of Roman domination has drawn to a close. Vespasian, the emperor who destroyed the temple, or under his destruction, the temple was, or under his rule, the temple was destroyed. Vespasian minted this coin, and it says Judea capta. So in other words, Jews are taken, Jerusalem or Judah is taken captive. And you can see there, Judah is weeping as a woman under this palm tree, and the Romans are ruling supreme. And that's what it was in AD 70. Interesting that Israel has now published or minted another coin. On the one side is Judea capta. That's what we were. But when you turn the coin over, on the other side is something completely different. Israel liberated 1948. And there's the woman no longer sitting down, but she is lifting up a child. And they are planting in the land of Israel. And the Roman soldier is nowhere to be seen. Well, that, friends, is the story of Rome. But it doesn't quite end there. Because you see... In Daniel chapter 2, verse 41, there was also the feet, which were part of potter's clay and part of iron. And following the Roman Empire, it would dissolve into these feet that would be mixed with iron and clay. And the kingdom would be partly divided, and it would have the strength of iron, because iron will, uh, is mixed with iry clay, miry clay. And the toes and the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. 
but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So at some point, iron would be mixed up with clay, and it's at this stage that it's going to be destroyed. It's described in Daniel chapter 7, a little bit more detail. He says, the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which is different from all other kingdoms. It's going to devour in pieces, and, and it's going to tread down and break in pieces, which we looked at. That's what it did. It devoured and break down, and it bruised elsewhere. And uh, But we read there in verse 8 that when he considered the horns... Amongst these little horns came up another little horn, before whom there were three horns that were plucked up. So this little horn would come along, and it would kick out three other horns, and it has eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So it's a bit of a terrible nightmare that is going to take place here. And it's during the time period of this little horn, it says, the ten horns which are on the head... Um, and they're going to be three removed, and this little horn's going to, going to come along. It's going to make war with the saints and prevail against them. And that's the rest of the story, which we're going to save for our next and final class in this series, which is looking at the feet of iron and clay, which represent what has become the nations of Europe today. But, just to cheat a tiny bit, the end story is given to us in Daniel chapter 2. The end result, of course, is that in the days of these kings, those two kingdoms that exist today, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And that kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it is going to break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it is going to stand forever. And it stands upon earth. Because that is where the kingdom of men currently resides. It's going to come, and that little stone which comes from heaven smites the image on the feet, the picture of what will be in the latter days. And in the place of this image, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. And friends, we live exactly in that time period. We live right on the knife edge of the kingdom of God being established on earth. What Christians have prayed for for thousands of years is about to be upon us. The times of the Gentiles have ended. The Lord Jesus Christ is about to return from heaven. And the reason it's worth looking at prophecy is to elicit in us a response. Because you remember the words of Revelation chapter 1? Blessed is he that readeth and those who hear and who keep the things that are written in this prophecy, for the time is at hand. So that's the onus on us, is not just to read them, not just to look at them, not just to be interested in the historical fact and see how that God, in fact, did work through time, but elicit a response from us to prepare ourselves. So we'd like to end by just reading a little section from the the letter of Paul to the Romans. Because really, this is the time period. Uh, It describes the time period in which we live. Just come to Romans chapter 12 for our last passage tonight. Sorry, Romans chapter 13. He says in verse 11, Knowing the time, it is now high time for us to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light and let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wandering and strife and envy, not in the things the world gets hooked up with, but walk honestly, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof.